Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. I believe we must build an alliance strong enough to deter those who might threaten war, close enough to provide for continuous and far-reaching consultation, trusting enough to accept the diversity of views, realistic enough to deal with the world as it is, and flexible enough to explore new channels of constructive cooperation. Ten years ago, Addressing the North Atlantic Council in this same room, President Eisenhower spoke of the need for unity. Listen to his words. There is not much strength in the finger of one hand, he said, but when five fingers are balled into a fist, you have a considerable instrument of defense. We need such an instrument of defense and the United States will bear its fair share in keeping NATO strong. All of us are also ready, as conditions change, to turn that fist into a hand of friendship. That was President Nixon addressing NATO. Good evening. I'm Mary Kissel with Stevens, Inc., and your host tonight for the Nixon Seminar on Conservative Realism and National Security. Our topic tonight is NATO, its mission, its role in the world, and its future as nations like Finland and Sweden apply for membership as Putin's war in Ukraine rages on. We're honored tonight to have our co-chairs, Secretary Mike Pompeo and Ambassador Robert O'Brien here for the discussion, along uh, with our very, very special guest, Ambassador Kay Bailey Hutchison, the U.S. Ambassador to NATO from 2017 to 2021, and before that, the Senator from the great state of Texas. So, uh, Ambassador Hutchison, I'm going to uh, take the moderator privilege and ask you the first question before throwing it over uh, to the secretary and the ambassador. Uh, you heard a lot of uh, common language there uh, that we've heard through the years. Uh, why don't you kick us off tonight with those, those common themes? What is it about NATO that has endured these many decades? Welcome. Well, I think Eisenhower's words, uh, as put forward by uh, President Nixon uh, said it all. And uh, I thought, and Nixon was very active with NATO. Um, he was there for the 25th anniversary and he was reinforcing the importance of America's leadership, but also doing what we all know every president since him has done. And that is to say to Europe, you need to do more. And I think that today we are now seeing a strength that Eisenhower saw, and that is that not only do we have our 30 partners pulling in the same direction, uh, but we have outside partners that now see the importance of protecting Western civilization, uh, the right of a sovereign nation to its own governing. Um, and I think that NATO is now uh, showing that we need to do more even. <laughs> Uh, to keep us together, because we're facing Russia now, but we all are looking beyond Russia to other adversaries that we must have a united front, a committed front, uh, to be able to uh, come out on top for our way of life and our values and what we think uh, is the way that people want to live. Uh, Secretary uh, Pompeo, uh, Article 1 uh, of NATO and you know NATO, you know just for folks who are listening, you know, founded back right after the war, April nine, April fourth, nineteen forty nine. These were many, many decades ago. Very few institutions endure for this period of time. It says, Article One. It was formed quote to safeguard the freedom, common heritage, and civilization on the people, founded on the principles of democracy, individual liberty, the rule of law. 
um, react a little bit to what Ambassador Hutchison just said and, and about these founding principles. Well, thanks, Mary. And Ambassador Hutchison, it's great to see you tonight. You did a fantastic job uh, as part of my team. Uh, thank you for that. Bless you. I love being um, on your team. <laughs> it was it was it was always a challenge, Mary, in, in the ways that you described, because um, it is indeed an organization long in the tooth. And we were, if, if, if there was one thing you could say about the Trump administration, we were determined to take every international organization and try to mold it into something that was fit for purpose for our times. I think that's what you heard President Nixon say. He was, he was talking about it in his time, in meeting the challenges that were being confronted at that moment. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the challenges that we were confronting were that we had European countries that had completely abandon their responsibility to do the right thing for their own people and weren't prepared to not only we, we talked about in terms of money and resources being provided as part of their defense efforts to be part of NATO, but they weren't willing to tell their citizens why it was. They weren't willing to make the case for their own security to their own citizens. And this is one of the things that I know Ambassador Hutchison and I worked on. We, we urged them to go back and defend NATO to their own citizenry so that they could justify the resources being allocated and actually make the case for the alliance being stronger and more capable. Uh, I still think this is centrally important. I think those citizens can see it more clearly now as a result of what's taking place in Ukraine. But good leaders in each of those countries, mostly parliamentary systems, but different in other places, different, different cultures as well, from Turkey to Finland is quite a stretch. But make no mistake about it, each of those leaders has the responsibility to make sure that they demonstrate its value to their own citizens. And if there's one thing I think we as American leaders have a responsibility to do is to continue to make that case. And you can only do that. You can only do that if you are serious, if you believe in NATO's mission and purpose and believe that it is, in fact, fit for our times. Uh, last thing I'll say in this opening thought was that both Ambassador Bryan and I Whenever we would see Secretary General Stoltenberg, and I know Ambassador Hutchinson was sincere about this as well, we would remind him of the threats from Europe, we would remind him about cybersecurity, and we would remind him that while Chinese Communist Party seems a long ways away, they are coming for you. And we devoted substantial American resources inside of NATO to help them understand that threat and help prepare NATO to confront what inevitably will be an alliance that has as a central feature the Chinese Communist Party as a partner threatening the very underpinnings of what you talked about in Article 1 of the NATO agreement. Ambassador O'Brien, just to follow up on what Secretary Pompeo just said, uh, urging national leaders to make their case to their citizens involves domestic politics, and you've got a U.S. security umbrella over the continent of Europe. So, you know, how do you incentivize leaders to do that? Does it take a threat like that from Vladimir Putin to light a fire, to get them to cough up the money and actually do what they need to do to make NATO more effective? Well, Mary, I, I think as I was listening to, to Senator Hutchinson and to uh, Secretary, Secretary Pompeo those, those days leading up to the December 19th, uh, uh, 2019 NATO summit, and we were pushing them very hard, and the president was pushing uh, NATO very hard. And I know that, that Mike had a lot of phone calls with uh, Jens Stoltenberg, and, and Kay was there with them often. I was on the phone with them a lot, trying to encourage our NATO allies to, to engage in burden sharing, to, not, not just because it was the right thing to do and fair to the American taxpayers, because it was, it was good for their own defense. And, uh, you know, we, we walked away from that summit after some very hard negotiating and some uh, – some unorthodox uh, diplomacy from President Trump, which uh, which gave, but but you know, it was just tough talk, but gave uh, uh, Secretary Pompeo, myself, and Kay a lot of leverage in those negotiations, and we walked away from that NATO summit with four hundred billion dollars in additional spending over ten years. I, I'm here in Europe right now, and, and greetings from France. But I started out the trip in Prague, and uh, and then went over to, to the UK uh, for a number of conferences. And I can't tell you how many of our my European colleagues and, and folks that that both Kay and Mike know pulled me aside and said, you guys were really right uh, back in December of 19. We gave you a hard time, uh, but, but you were right. We should have spent more money. Uh, we're glad we spent the money you convinced us to spend, and, uh, and we understand that going forward, we're going to have to replenish the stocks that we're giving to Ukraine to help them defend their country, and, and we're going to have to do the things that you asked us to do. So I think 
uh, there, there was a lot of foresight that we didn't get credit for in the Trump administration as, as we urged the Europeans to do the hard thing. But as, as Mike alluded to, it was tough. And as you mentioned, Mary, because you have uh, a number of countries that, that benefited from a U.S. security umbrella, and why not? They, they, you know, folks criticized us for an American first foreign policy, but Germany certainly had a German first foreign policy, and other European countries uh, put their country first. And by doing so, they, they'd allow the U.S. to defend them while they traded with the Chinese and bought cheap oil from the Russians. And uh, and I think they've realized that that's not a winning sway, a winning formula. And that they've got to decouple from the Russians and uh, and ratchet back from the Chinese and, and defend themselves. And and America will be with them as a strong partner as they do so. But uh, but we, we we have to expect more from our allies. And I think our allies understand that now, having seen uh, Vladimir Putin invade Ukraine. I think it. Uh, it's not a time to say, I told you so, but it's a time for us to say, now, now let's roll up our sleeves and work even harder together. Yeah, it's such an important point. Our national security shouldn't be a partisan issue. Um, we, we need to defend the free world. Uh, I'm just going to ask one more question of Ambassador Hutchison before we pull in our seminar members, many of whom have had also firsthand experience working inside NATO. Uh, Ambassador Hutchison, uh, both the Secretary uh, and Ambassador O'Brien, they've talked about this unorthodox diplomacy, uh, trying to urge the nations of Europe to step up uh, after so many decades of this organization being in existence. What, take us behind the scenes. What was that like? I mean, you were at NATO for, for many, many years. Uh, how does that work? Is it done at the dinner parties? <laughs> Is it done in kind of the back rooms? Is it, how, how, does, how does it look from your point of view when you're sitting there at headquarters? Well, uh, first of all, I want to say that I, I, I want to add on to what Secretary Pompeo and Ambassador O'Brien said about the leadership that w we showed. And what we did and, and what they did especially was uh, to say to the Europeans that it was like a missile had been hit when they started talking about China. And all of my colleagues were saying, what? China? And this was like 2019, and no one had China on the radar. But Secretary uh, Pompeo and O'Brien and Keith Kroc uh, said, we've got to have communications that do not include Huawei. And if we don't do that, then we're going to have Huawei all over Europe and we're not going to have the security that we need to communicate when all of these things that were happening was during the Belt and Road Initiative that China was doing all over Europe. And it, and so we were seeing these signals, but no one had put it together. Uh, but they did, and we did. And yes, it does happen um, to your question, Mary. Uh, we had so many events just with our own colleagues. Uh, it was a very close knit and all of our colleagues were, were close. And never was there a personal aspect to it. It was dealing with the issues. And the Europeans want us to lead. I was told that time and again, we want you to lead. Yes, we need to be pushed sometimes. We want you to push. Because they know that we will assess a risk and we will lead the way to deter that risk. Whereas they don't have that instinct. They don't assess a risk and then say, this is, these are the steps we're going to take. But they will follow us. And our administration did push very hard. And led by the two who are leading this um, seminar, uh, Secretary Pompeo, uh, Ambassador O'Brien, um, Secretary both Mattis and Esper, uh, we were all going in the direction of saying we've got to clear our channels as we look forward to other adversaries. We've got to have more input from Europe, which actually Nixon said very strongly when he said we're going to do more to deter Russia. We expect Europeans to do more right there with us. And when the Middle East came into play, President Nixon was the one that opened the door that we are now following right now uh, to NATO going outside of the geographic boundaries. And President Nixon said, we've got problems in the Middle East. 
problems in Africa, and we need to address anything that will be a security risk to any of our allies. So, uh, yes, the the collegiality in our uh, in in NATO is great, even when some are, you know. Every, there were several uh, presidents that had different views. We're seeing right now President Erdogan uh, having a different view about expansion of NATO. And I know you're going to talk about that later, but there's a lot of diplomacy going on right now uh, to make sure that we do have the addition of Sweden and Finland. They will be a great value added. And so everyone is coming together now to negotiate because everything is done by consensus. And let me mention one other thing. Um, when we had the 75th anniversary, I brought all of the ambassadors into the Senate and I asked Jean Shaheen and Tom Tillis, the co-chairs of the NATO caucus, uh, to talk to them because I wanted them to hear how bipartisan our support for NATO was, but especially that our politicians run campaigns saying that we're pro-NATO, whereas Europeans tend to hide defense spending. They tend to hide money spent on security. Sometimes they spent more than was in the record because they would hide, say, a military base under the housing programs in their countries. So I was trying to show them how, just what Secretary Pompeo was saying, that we should be talking to our publics and bringing them into the risks that we're facing so that the support for NATO will stay strong. Well, as you said, Ambassador, there is uh, quite a, a lot of unity, um, maybe more than was anticipated after Putin invaded Ukraine. The current administration was uh, reluctant to get involved, offered uh, Volodymyr Zelensky a ticket out. He famously said, I don't need a, a ticket, I need ammo. Uh, I want to go to Bridge Colby, the author of The Strategy of Denial, and maybe ask a bit of a provocative question uh, to you, Bridge. But we don't have total unity in NATO. Uh, as uh, the senior leaders here have, have pointed out, um, it's really hard to get the Europeans to do what needs to be done. Uh, can NATO really afford to expand? Is that such a good idea? Or should we be thinking a little differently about our common defense? Well, thanks, Marianne. It's an honor to be part of this uh, important conversation. And I look, I think that's a very legitimate question. And I think if, if I were advising the Senate, I would say they should look very carefully and rigorously at the potential entry of Sweden and Finland into the alliance. I mean, I think the situation uh, was improved uh, thanks to the leadership of the three, three leaders here uh, and President Trump under the last administration in terms of greater defense spending. And now there are greater pledges by the Europeans, the Germans above all, uh, in the last couple of months. I mean, it, it's unfortunate that it took the invasion of Ukraine for that to happen. I wish they'd listened more to, to you know, American leaders over the last few years. But that's where we are. But <clears throat> the reality is you know, the Russians have been weakened, but they still pose a significant challenge. And there are significant gaps in allied defense. And, you know, I think the macro perspective here, maybe you're provoking me to mention, <laughs> is that we face a greater challenge, as I think Secretary Pompeo uh, if I could put a little bit of take take a little bit of liberty with what he said, that the primary threat that we face is from China and from the Chinese Communist Party, and that threat is by the administration's own admission now acute. It's no longer just the Indo-PACOM commanders who are saying that; it's of real Haynes, the DNI, and Bill Burns, the DCIA. And you know, we don't have a military that's capable of concurrently dealing with both both theaters. And the natural solution to that is for the Europeans to step up, and they are they are doing that, but. You know, we should be cherry about that, in my view, uh, in a kind of Nixonian way, um, before expanding our commitments. My view is that it's 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 it is there are answer there are probably answers to the questions in terms of the of Finland and Sweden. Um, you know, Finland has a very robust defense force. Um, I think the largest artillery force in Europe. But my own view is, you know, there should be a, 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 a skeptical look by the Senate, you know, ask for answers in the way that the first round of NATO expansion was done. There were very detailed analyses to provide to the Senate 
for the admission of Poland, Hungary, and uh, I think it was Czechoslovakia at the time. That's a level of, I mean, you know, Finland has an 800-mile border with Russia. That's going to be a significant expansion of NATO's threat surface to Russia. Um, to me, the kinds of things that I would want to see uh, as part of that package would be, for instance, the European states agreeing to, say, 2.5 or even 3 percent as the uh, uh, level of defense spending that they should uh, uh, not only aspire to meet, but actually meet in the near to medium term. And General Cavoli basically endorsed moving above the 2 percent uh, level in his uh, hearing uh, before the SASC the other day. Uh, and I would also uh, I would also say the Europeans taking a much more significant role in the conventional defense of Europe, wh which would allow the United States to focus more on Asia. And I know, you know, that was part of the argument that, that Ambassador O'Brien and, and others were making at the, at, the, at the latter part of the Trump administration. That we need to be able to do that. So I think that's the that's the mission. I, I think there's actually a real opportunity here, which is the Russians have kind of hopefully blunted their spear a little bit. It's going to take them a while to get back to the high level of, of readiness and capability that we, we feared a few years ago, I think rightly, but, but maybe they've, they've tripped up. And at the same time, the Europeans are willing to do more. And I think that that's something that we should encourage. And more than encourage, we should really put pressure. I think there's a real concern, particularly in Germany, about a backing off of, of what they call the Zeitenwende, you know, the, the turning the sea change. And you know, more than anybody else, the Germans are going to be the critical player here. And, the, and there has to be pressure. And this is a big... Uh, criticism I have of the current administration is that they have tended to uh, sort of placate or be accommodating to the Europeans. And, and, you know, we can't push them too hard. But I think if anything, over the last, you know, 40, 30 or 40 years, we've been too gentle. And, and this has been the result where we've not been prepared. And so I think continued pressure and clarity of expectation, because just to kind of maybe put a final point on it, what I say to Europeans often when I talk about this with them is, Look, even though the Biden administration is doubling down in a lot of ways in Europe, this is not changing the fundamental facts that China is 10 times the size of Russia and that the military situation in Asia is much more significant. And if we, the Americans, neglect the problem, we could get to a point where we are either forced to very, very rapidly and kind of um, uh, abruptly shift focus to Asia because the Chinese make a move, or we might be defeated, in which case we will have to have a very radical shift Asia. And if the Europeans are not prepared, they're the ones who will bear the risk. So I think we're better off looking at things clearly uh, and, and seeing them. And then in my experience, you know, which is not much compared to many of the people on this call, but my experience is that actually European officials uh, and, and experts actually are prepared to reckon with this reality. I mean, they're not children. They, they are, you know, I mean, they <laughs> obviously serious countries with long histories. Uh, the Very. Germans themselves, for instance, had a very robust military, not just in World War II, but until 1989. They had the largest mil military in NATO Europe. So this is not something that's beyond their ability. We just need to give them the right set of incentives to follow. John Noonan, I want to throw to you to react. Over to you, John. Yeah, I, um, I, I find myself uh, agreeing with Bridge in some critical areas and maybe uh, politely disagreeing in others. Uh, I just got back from a week in Finland doing a review of their uh, defense capabilities, and I frankly came away somewhat impressed. Uh, they have a strong army that this uh, country of 5 million can get up to 280,000 soldiers if necessary. Uh, they will instantly bring um, uh, several fighter squadrons into the alliance and eventually six full squadrons of F-35s into the alliance. Uh, they have a small navy, but it's asymmetric and designed for sea denial, which is helpful to deny in the Baltic Sea to the Russians. Uh, and they have absolutely superb, superb cyber capabilities. Um, Bridge brought up, I think, very uh, fairly uh, the point about the fact that we will immediately add an 800-mile border uh, with Russia. Frankly, I think that's a bigger problem for the Russians than it is for NATO. Um, the Finns are exquisitely capable at defending that terrain. Uh, it is difficult terrain. It's swampy, it's forested, uh, and we've seen how, how tough of a time the Russians have had with that type of terrain just in Ukraine itself. Um, I do, uh, per Bridges' points, I do have some concerns. Uh, the first is the Finns are still very Russia-focused. After 80 years of prepping for a Russian invasion that, uh, that frankly followed a Russian invasion of the 1939-1940 war, um, they're still, they, have, they have long looked to their east, and I think they will continue to do so uh, even after they join 
uh, NATO, and we are looking to um, the West. Second is, I'm not sure that they're fully aware of what it means to be part of a multinational alliance like NATO. Um, it involves overseas exercises. It involves um, uh, a Navy that can project, which they don't have. It requires strategic airlift capability and strategic sea lift capability. It requires airborne brigades. Uh, they don't have all of those things. Now, no member, NATO member state is perfect, and I, I'd be the first to admit that. The, the Finns are still very capable um, but they're going to have a little bit of growing to do. And I think this is going to be difficult for a country that is uh, that's famously non-aligned uh, and willing and, and um, frankly, conditioned to, um, to to go it alone. Um, I will note uh, to, to kind of counterbalance the counterbalance um, that having two strong, capable partners in NATO uh, will allow us to shift to the Pacific um, uh, in a way that I think is rapid and without um, without significant security risk um, to, to our what will be our Eastern Front um, between just feed, between Finland and Sweden alone. You're talking about adding 12 fighter squadrons and almost half a million soldiers if we have to. Um, that does not make us any weaker, and that does not put us in any weaker of a position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China. Um, so I think it's ultimately a net positive. I'll finish with a very quick anecdote. Um, my big concern going to going um, to Helsinki last week was that uh, the Finnish population is uh, obviously very strongly in support of joining NATO, but I, I was concerned it was something of an emotional reaction to the Ukraine uh, invasion, which is normal for a country that's been invaded in, in recent memory by the Russians. Um, I asked several of their Green Party, Green Party, uh, parliamentarians, what they thought about a potential uh, being part of an alliance where the United States may be out of the START treaty when it expires in several years. That's a nuclear arms limitation treaty um, that doesn't have a very good prospect for being uh, renewed or re-upped with the Russian Federation, um, thinking that they would be quite uncomfortable with it, Greens being Greens. It's a party uh, exclusively uh, centered on, um, on green issues and climate issues. To, to my great surprise, their tact was, uh, we, we support a nuclear-free world, but NATO can't be the, the, the ones to unilaterally disarm. It has to be, come as part of a treaty or a partnership, which, believe it or not, that's the, the Ronald Reagan traditional conservative position on nuclear weapons. Um, so I was somewhat heartened by uh, you know, what I would consider one of the more left-leaning uh, parties uh, being quite comfortable with the idea of being part of a nuclear alliance, uh, whether or not this lasts, time will tell. I, thank you so much for that, John. And uh, it's it's so interesting to have these different points of view as you guys travel the world and talk talk to our partners. Uh, I want to get back to our special guest, Ambassador uh, Hutchison, because we do have a, a problem in NATO, and it's called. Turkey, although it's now spelled differently after President Erdogan uh, decided to call it Turkey A or uh, the way that it's uh, pronounced over there. Um, and he doesn't want uh, Finland and Sweden to join unless they take his point of view on certain factions of the Kurd that he considers terrorists and we've considered partners. Um, can we kick nations out of NATO? Uh, we've seen Turkey play both sides. How much of a partner are they actually? What was your personal experience with the Turks? Very interesting. Um, there is no mechanism to kick anyone out of NATO. Uh, that's why we come to consensus. Sometimes it is a labored process. And uh, you see uh, having different views sometimes, like Hungary, like Turkey right now. Um, but I think that Turkey also is looking at the Turkish interests and looking at a bilateral issue with which most other allies disagree. And that is on the YPG, which is their uh, big um, concern. I was somewhat um, encouraged when I saw that Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary General, is getting very engaged and he has kept a good relationship with President Erdogan and called Turkey 
rightly, a, a strong NATO ally. Since NATO uh, brought Turkey in, they have been real contributors in all of our missions. They've been good partners, um, but they, they tend to put their bilateral issues where they might differ with the other allies uh, front and center when there is a need in their opinion to do so. But I was encouraged by uh, Secretary uh, Stoltenberg talking to Erdogan and basically laying out what Turkey would need uh, to let this happen. And it was, uh, and, and I think there's a language uh, issue here where they want some recognition of what the Kurds have done to Turkey. And the, the Kurds, um, the Syrian Kurds have uh, made trouble for uh, Turkey. There's no doubt about that. But as all of you know, uh, the uh, the Kurds that are not the PKK, but the YPG have been very strong allies with America and our other allies in fighting ISIS. They have taken the, the brunt of fighting ISIS after we um, left in Iraq before the deed was completely done and ISIS rose back up. And uh, those uh, Kurds, the YPG arm of the Kurds with America and our other allies have been very effective partners. So there's got to be a language worked out, which I'm encouraged will be worked out, um, assessing PKK, which we all agree are terrorists. Um, there will be language, I think, that will say that. And then lifting sanctions on Turkey can probably be worked out. You know, we have sanctions on selling F-35s to Turkey because they put a Russian missile defense system on their soil. And we couldn't allow that and still sell them the F-35. That has been a bone of contention in NATO with all the other allies uh, for what Turkey did. So all these things having been said, Turkey has been a strong ally. I do believe things will be worked out. It will not be maybe easy, but um, Finland and Sweden will be a value added in NATO. And I, I thought what John said was very uh, good and important. Uh, I think that one other factor I would put in is that having Finland and Sweden in, in the European uh, NATO alliance is going to be very helpful when we are confronting China, because the Europeans uh, want the trade with China. China values trade with Europe, and having Europe even more consolidated with Finland and Sweden in NATO, if we have to use sanctions against China, it will be more effective having Sweden and Finland, which are two large uh, parts of EU, uh, as well as uh, any kind of trade relationship with, with China. So I think it's going to strengthen us against China, as well as uh, being a value added for their military uh, prowess. And the fact that they have been with us in Afghanistan, both Sweden and Finland, major contributors in Afghanistan. So they've not only done that, but they've They've uh, done exercises with us on a regular basis. They are very strong partners already. And I think it will be a seamless addition and one that will be to all of our uh, value. I was going to bring in uh, Matt Pottinger here, if he's uh, still with us. Yeah, there he is. Great. Hi, Matt. Um, Matt, you know, your your life experience touches on a lot of these areas. You, you know, you know. Uh, served the United States in Afghanistan. You lived in China for many years. Um, can you expand on this point that Ambassador Hutchison is making uh, about how you know, strengthening the alliance in Europe may actually help us uh, strengthen our defense against communist China? Yeah, it's a great... Ambassador uh, K. Bailey Hutchison, it's great to see you. Thanks for... for uh... Uh, making time tonight and for all of the great work that you did uh, uh, supporting us and, and our strategy. Uh, it, it's great to see you again. Look, I, I, you know, one of the things that um, uh, that I, I think we've learned from the war in Ukraine, first of all, is that arguments that we'd heard 
for many, many years that, that NATO expansion was uh, inherently provocative. I think that we've been, the, the opposite has been proven right now as a result of this war. Um, even the Chancellor of Germany, Olaf Scholz, I remember just a, a couple of days after Russian tanks were rolling into Ukraine, headed towards the capital, Kiev. Um, he said that uh, uh, to his own uh, parliament, quote, anyone who reads Vladimir Putin's historicizing essays, who has watched his televised uh, declaration of war on Ukraine, or who has recently, as I have done, held hours of direct talks with Vladimir Putin, can no longer have any doubt that Putin wants to build a Russian empire. So in fact, I, I mean, if, if we think of what might have happened had Poland, for example, not been in NATO, uh, would we would Poland now be at war? Um, I, I think that it, it shows that, in fact, um, uh, to the extent that we've uh, had any effective deterrence, it's been uh, NATO countries that have so far been able to deter uh, an invasion that I believe would have come <laughs> uh, for those other countries had they not been part of NATO. Um, it, Mary, to your point, you know, the only time that the Article 5 of NATO, which is the, the collective defense, you know, an attack on one NATO ally is an attack on all NATO allies, the only time that that's been uh, invoked it was uh, in a very different theater. It was, it was after planes crashed into uh, American cities, into our buildings in New York City, in the Pentagon, uh, in Washington, and, uh, and, and also in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, when terrorists uh, attacked us at home in the United States, and we ended up going to war as an alliance uh, in uh, a very unexpected corner uh, of the world in Afghanistan for, you know, almost two decades. Um, how prepared, Ambassador, do you think uh, the, the NATO allies are for both psychologically, spiritually, if you like, uh, and certainly materially, for the possibility that the United States will be attacked uh, in uh, the Western Pacific as part of a, a, uh, a you know, ill-fated invasion if, if Xi Jinping decides that he wants to invade Taiwan, and if he decides that attacking um, U.S. warships and planes is, is part of his plan to ensure the success of an invasion of Taiwan, what, what, is the, what does it look like uh, in, in, in the alliance if that if that terrible day comes to pass, um, given that it was sort of a shock, as you mentioned back in 2019, when 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 Jens Stoltenberg really started to to uh, uh, to talk openly about that possibility. Well, I think we did start the conversation when after the defense review, uh, the strategic review came out and said uh, our strategic threats for the next ten years are Russia and China. China first, and then Russia, uh, as well as Iran, as well in North Korea, as secondary, but focused on China. And it was a shockwave in NATO. But I think because of the Belt and Road Initiative, because they have expanded the Belt and Road uh, Arctic Initiative, which has is another reason that Finland and Sweden are going to be very important partners. Uh, we need more activity in the high north. Um, and I think that we will have to push the Europeans, that's for sure, um, to use the economic sanctions against China, because I, I think in a way that's a, even a more um, productive way to address China than Russia, because China needs the economic trade that they get from Europe and the United States and Canada, et cetera. And I think that they will factor that in if they decide to make designs on Taiwan. And that's why I think uh, the Europeans should continue to have in the forefront. And I think they will. There will be a strategic review um, a reset at the June summit that is going to happen. And I think there will be uh, an addition of China into the uh, NATO concept. And I think we are just gonna move uh, looking at uh, what uh, China does, looking at what they do with regard to Russia and the Ukraine, uh, 
certainly I think we should be working more on India uh, as uh, an asset and they're going to be more interested in what we do against China because they have seen now China for what it is after that altercation up in the their northern border. Uh, Australia will be very strong with us as well. Uh, Japan is thinking of going to the summit. Uh, they have said that their uh, president is thinking of going because they're concerned. So I think we're going to have a, a, a strong front, not that it's going to be, a, uh, I, I think it's going to be a slow movement depending on the things that she does. But I think what we're doing is, is strategically important that we set the stage. Pompeo, you, you Matt Pottinger, as well as uh, Ambassador O'Brien, uh, set the stage for us addressing China as a potential adversary. And now that is building momentum and building strength and building commitment among our allies. Uh, and the partners that I've talked about in Asia that also uh, are more concerned about China. So I think we're, uh, and with Stoltenberg's leadership, I can't say enough about the importance of his leadership to America. He's so pro-American and pro-NATO, and he's very strong. He's disarming, I always say disarmingly smart, because he's he's just kind of like you, O'Brien, you know, just this jolly fellow that's always got a happy face, but he is tough and strong and he is clear-eyed just like you are. And I think that um, having him there and extending his term was very uh, important and bringing in Finland and Sweden will add a strength. And I think we're moving in the right direction for NATO itself. I wanna bring in Alex uh, Gray. Alex, we're so used to talking about these nations as individual threats. We've got a Russia problem. We have a China problem. We have an Iran problem. Um, but the, the bad guys all talk to each other is, you know, it really the right way to think about it to, to say, well, we, we need to focus on one or the other. Or aren't they all part of a, a, a larger problem that we're confronting? Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's there's certainly some macro trends that we, we've got to think about. Um, the, and the one thing I would say, and I, I think Bridge has made this point um, well now and in the past, is is that you look at what is the U.S. interest in Europe right now? And the U.S. interest, in, in my estimation, is uh, to get out of Europe. I mean, uh, to, to manage the security environment in such a way that we can turn our attention to the Indo-Pacific. And, you know, NATO is the tool that will allow us to do that, in my view. And, and I've, you know, Ambassador O'Brien and I called uh, in the Wall Street Journal not long ago before the Ukraine invasion for Finland and Sweden to join NATO precisely because it would be a, a bulwark against Russian imperialism. It would be a burden sharing mechanism that would let us pivot to the Indo-Pacific. The, the more that NATO is, is burden sharing, the better it is for our number one geostrategic priority, which, which is Asia in, in my estimation. So my, my real question, um, and I'd love to hear what the group has to say about this, especially those who have really studied alliance architecture, um, is what are the lessons of how NATO works and, and how NATO has operated uh, over its, its history for what we're trying to do in the Indo-Pacific? You know, right now, we don't have a formal alliance structure. We have the Quad. We have individual security alliances, bilateral security alliances, uh, mutual security treaties. But what have we learned that is... Um, you know, that can be taken from, from the NATO example and transferred to the Indo-Pacific? Uh, what have we learned that we don't want to replicate? And, and how, how, is, how, how are the, the lessons of that 75-plus year history uh, applicable to the, the, conf the confrontation with China? That's a great set of questions. I'm going to bring in Secretary Pompeo just because I know that uh, he dealt with those formal structures like NATO um, but also those informal structures like the Quad, and also, Mr. Secretary, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you also had a, a different flexible group that included the likes of Brazil talking to India uh, and some nations in Asia. Um, you know, if, if you could address Alex's question there, sir, we'd love to have your thoughts. Uh, t two things. One, you know, we, we've talked about NATO as a historic matter. We've talked about southern flanks and northern flanks. 
I think the world's just changed. I get it. I can still read a map. Uh, but as, as you listen to as the, the conversation, you can see that um, it, it is more complicated than that today. Um, second, you know, one of the things that, that frustrated me and, you know, Kate didn't talk about me being jolly all the time. I thought that was fascinating. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but one of the things that was frustrating is you had this consensus organization, right? Need, need everybody in. It turns out that over 70 years, that's probably the right solution for organizations that are security related predominantly. So think DOD and state, even to a second secondary degree, uh, you need everybody to have had the chance to say their piece before they are committed because they will be asked to do things that no one contemplates when they join, join the program. Uh, just, just as Matt was talking about Afghanistan being the first use of Article 5, I promise you when uh, this was all brought together at the end of the 1940s, no one was thinking about counterterrorism in Tora Bora. <laughs> <laughs> that was just, right, this is not some, but every member was in, every member had signed off on it. And so no one could say, well, that's not my deal. I was, remember me, I was against that. So as you think about these other organizations, you have to tolerate the diversity. Second thing is the lesson that flows from that is one of the benefits that NATO has had is there was a pretty homogenous set of values when it arose uh, in these places. And as you move away from that, as you move away from governmental structures that are different from uh, the ones that are currently in the particular group, whichever one you sign up for, uh, you will find that that will be even more cumbersome and you are more likely to face risk of defections that actually prevent you from achieving the organization's ends. Um, the last one is the one that Mary was referring to. Uh, under the auspices of COVID, I brought together a group, Mary, remind me, maybe 10 countries. Um, they were, mm, yes. it, was, it was a unique collection. It wasn't all of the European countries. Um, but we, we used something that everybody had a shared set of understandings around and frankly needed the United States support on. We used COVID as a chance to bring them together. That provided air cover for their diplomats. They could say, oh, I'm getting on this call with the Israelis. I'm getting on this phone call with the Brazilians. We, we provided cover for action, something I learned as a CIA director. Uh, and we could over time, and we did over time, uh, well, the last 14, 15 months, um, we did over time expand the conversation to the things that I was really trying to drive that group. I think we, in the end, I think we had 35 or 40% of the world's GDP as part of the group. And we began to talk about things that were broader. And we, they were, these were foreign ministers that were on the phone or on the conference call um, who weren't, didn't speak to each other regularly, had never met each other outside of uh, uh, passing in the hallway at the UN General Assembly in the fall of each year. And we began to get a cohesion and a, a normative set of understandings about how that group would respond to things in a way that laid the foundation for something that had we had to uh, grab them to do something really important and really difficult. We wouldn't have had Article 5 to fall back on. We wouldn't have had a collective agreement that we could point to. But I think we increased the likelihood that the, that group of nations would more readily come together around an important matter. And so to your point, Alex, I think those are all important components of how you think about putting together groups of nations around a shared set of interests, even when uh, you had folks on the, you, you had foreign ministers on the phone that couldn't even travel to each other's countries. And, um, and so I, I think that was useful as a construct to begin to think about how we are going to confront the Chinese Communist Party as we all move forward together. And NATO will be a bulwark at giving the capacity for the United States to turn its attention and focus to that uh, all important matter. We've got about 10 minutes left in the seminar, and I want to make sure that we get uh, all of the members in. Um, Morgan Ortegas, uh, you're uh, very deeply involved in uh, U.S. politics. You have a great sense of uh, what's going on on the ground. Um, we've got, uh, it seems like, a pretty broad consensus here that we like NATO. We want it to continue. Some think we should expand quickly. Some don't. Um, do you sense that uh, same commitment? among the U.S. public, that support uh, for NATO and endeavors like this? You know, I think it's interesting. Um, that's a great question, Mary. And, and, and it's interesting because one of the things that surprised me about some recent polling is that um, 
For me, Afghanistan and, and our terrible withdrawal last August, where we saw 13 of our best that perished, uh, you know, and, and just in a manner that they, they, should, they should not have, um, that really resonated with me and, sh and, and, and stuck with me and the American people. Um, and I think that was a turning point in the Biden presidency. Fast forward to Russia invading Ukraine. All the polling that I'm looking at, um, I, I'm actually seeing that it is uh, permeating the American uh, psyche uh, uh, even more than Afghanistan did. It, it's making a a, you know, a bigger difference um, on Biden and, and his team. So I say that to say that often we think that the American people aren't necessarily, you know, paying attention to things like NATO and foreign policy and the things that we all care about. But I think if we can make the case and we can show people, uh, you know, for example, uh, I was just in Ukraine a couple of weeks ago. I was in Lviv uh, working with a group that rescues orphans from the east and the south and the contested areas and gets them to Lviv. I did a lot of TV from there, Mayor. Um, a, a lot of different conservative outlets, outlets to make the case to, to the American people that this is why we need to care about this war. Now, Secretary Pompeo has said it best on, on his interviews when he said this has to be Europe-led. And I think that's where Bridge and I and others have been, while supportive of NATO, critical of where we have been thus far um, in the Russia-Ukraine war, because we continue for like every 40 billion we send, it's about 2 billion um, from the Europeans. And the Europeans are sending every five weeks, they're sending the equivalent of $40 billion of payments um, to Russia for their energy. So um, I love a kumbaya moment. I love all of us talking about how great NATO is and the relationship is and our European partners. But I think that um, it is not as rosy on the ground if you're in Ukraine. It's not as rosy on the ground in Europe. I, I still think that the Europeans have a long way to go and we have to hold them accountable because if they are unwilling to stop Russia in their own backyard, they are not going to be with us um, on Taiwan and China. And there's, there's two meetings, a, a lot of meetings with Secretary Pompeo um, in 2019 and 2020 stuck out with me. But two that I remember very strongly once we were in London and then once we were in, I believe it was Switzerland, um, when, when the leaders that we were speaking with in, in both countries looked at Secretary Pompeo as we were talking about the threat of the Chinese Communist Party. And basically, they both said at very different points in, in those two years, no one can do this but America. No one can lead but America, referring to, uh, you know, the the fight that would be needed. I, I use the word fight literally, well, or figuratively and literally, I guess, uh, that would be needed to, to be undertaken against the Chinese um, Communist Party. So um, I, I do think that the American people are paying attention to this. I think they are concerned when they start to see the images that we've all seen in World War II movies come to life, right, in Europe. I mean, it, it's it's pretty surreal to see these images that, you know, our, our World War II generation that we see in movies now on the streets of Europe. So I think we need to continue to make the case to the American people why it matters. I think they're with us. But I, but I think simultaneously, we have to keep pressure on the Europeans, both public and both private. And I think the best case is that you have someone like Mike Pompeo and Robert O'Brien combined uh, with um, Ambassador Hutchinson. Uh, you have good cop and bad cop, and that seemed to be a pretty winning combo um, in the Trump administration. Bridge Colby, you had one last follow-up, and then uh, we're going to uh, bring it back to our special guests and our co-chairs. Bridge, Great. go ahead. Thanks, Mary. And I, I wanted to build on, on Morgan's really excellent point and just sort of the realism of it, because I do think that's where we need to to, to be sort of thinking in our heads and the strategic reality and also what Alex said about the severity of the problem and the need to, to, fo to shift focus. But I think there's sort of two things that come to mind for me. And I think that if we tap into the kind of Nixon legacy, I mean, one is what Secretary Pompeo, I think, was suggesting is focus NATO on its core mission, right? I mean, an alliance that that, I mean, the, the downside is it's unwieldy, but the thing that binds it together is ultimately a, a security, a defense alliance for the North Atlantic area and the European area at this point. And that, you know, if there are countries with different political systems and legacies and so forth, you know, there was Greece and Portugal and so forth were in the alliance during the Cold War. That's part and parcel of the deal. It's a military alliance. So make sure it does its part. And if a country says, well, I give a lot to development, that ain't the same thing. Countries need to step up. And that's both strategically necessary. And I think to Morgan's point, it's also politically necessary for the sustainability of these organizations that the Europeans and particularly the Germans and others really do step up. And then I would say, again, picking a, a page from the Nixon legacy is sort of make the alliance and the, and the coalitions fit for purpose, uh, to use the, the term that was being used. I mean, the downside of over-NATOizing everything is, you know, we forget about the other 
atos that mm -hmm. were created, CETO and CENTO and stuff that fell apart. And I think in the context of Asia, trying to create a NATO-like structure there would probably be a bad idea. We'd be better off focusing on the bilateral and kind of minilateral organizations, but instead really focusing on getting countries to pull their weight, particularly Taiwan and Japan, maybe the Australians netting together, the South Koreans taking the, the China threat more seriously. But I think, again, it's about having them be fit for purpose and sort of focused on what they're supposed to do and not getting kind of lost in some of the extraneous things. And then similarly in the Middle East, you know, you've got the Abraham Accords. That's something to work with. It's focused on a counter-Iranian, you know, anti-hegemonic coalition. Work with that. That's what's available. So, I mean, I think that's the kind of model to answer Alex's question and building on some of the earlier comments that I would, I would suggest is the way to go. Okay, we're going to turn it uh, back over to the co-chairs for some final thoughts, and then we'll have Ambassador Hutchison wrap it up for us. Let's go first to Ambassador uh, O'Brien. Thank you, Mary. And uh, let's, I, I want to focus on this Finland and, and Sweden issue for just a moment. I think that uh, Senator Hutchinson and, uh, and John Newton had it absolutely right. We've got an incredibly capable uh, set of countries there. And, and what we tried to do in the Trump administration was move some of our troops from Germany uh, to Asia Pacific and also move some of those troops out of Germany into Poland. Uh, I think both those uh, were pressure moves, and, and I think Finland allows us to do that. But I think, and, and Sweden joining NATO allows us to move some of those troops uh, immediately to places like Guam, the Aleutian Islands, Hawaii, uh, even if we want to keep on U.S. territory. Uh, number two, look, Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping is watching what is going on right now. And he saw Putin invade Ukraine, hoping that he'd drive a wedge into NATO. Uh, instead, he got a more unified NATO, and it, now he's going to get an expanded NATO with Sweden and Finland, uh, obviously detrimental, uh, highly detrimental to the Russians. And he's got to be thinking about that. If I invade Taiwan, what happens with the Quad? Does the Quad become a, a, a mini NATO or a, 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 an official alliance that has a military capability? Does South Korea, which is already making noises about joining the Quad, uh, join? I, I, I'm here in France. The French officials are talking about trying to get involved in the the quad it would be you know, obviously oxys would be problematic for him. So, so Xi Jinping is watching NATO become stronger as a result of the invasion. The last thing he wants to do is see a stronger alliance system uh, in in uh, the Indo Pacific as a result of an invasion of Taiwan. So, I, I think the the outcome of, of, of the NATO uh, enlargement is going to be important in, in deterring him. The final point I'll make that uh, you know Kay talked about and you know Mike talked about. Uh, you know, maybe not always being jolly, but uh, uh, Mike, you'll remember we had a, uh, I think it was almost an all-night negotiating session with uh, President Erdogan and his team uh, uh, in, in, I think, September of uh, uh, 2019. Uh, it, it was tough sledding. We saved, I think, in, in that night about 8,000 of our uh, uh, Kurdish allies, literally, you know, on sat phones with, with the Secretary's team of Ambassador Jeffries and Satterfield and others, uh, calling General Muslim and getting those those troops uh, extricated and uh and, and evacuated. I think we saved a lot of Turkish lives as well because we uh, we stopped a uh, uh, what would have been a pretty terrible battle in uh, in northern Turkey, and the secretary played a, a key role in, in making that happen. And, and so I think at the end of the day, even in the most difficult circumstances, the Turks can be negotiated with. They are part of NATO, and I think you know with some some tough diplomacy, I think we can get over their objections uh, that, that you know Kay laid out. Uh, with the YPG and PKK and uh, uh, and the other groups that they that, that we hear you know about quite regularly, yeah, I, I think we can't get the Turks over their objections and and encourage this enlargement. And again, I think it sends a, a real terrific message to uh, to Beijing, where they're, they, Xi Jinping is the biggest audience for what's happening in Ukraine right now. Thank you. Thank you, Miss. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Secretary Pompeo, final thoughts. I don't have much to add other than. Uh, NATO needs to focus on its core mission, needs to be ready for these times. And the United States is going to uh, depend on the European countries, largely the big economies inside of Europe, to drive that process. And when they do, when they get that done well, we will be able to focus on these, on these other priorities that the American people are going to ultimately demand that we prioritize. Uh, we, need, we need NATO to actually deliver against its promise set in 2022 and 2025 such that America can continue to focus on the things that we are certain to confront as the years proceed. Thank you, sir. Ambassador Hutchison, we need NATO to deliver. Will it deliver in your experience? Final thoughts. You know, I think that NATO is going to be the convener 
of uh, the Western allies and partners. I think that is going to be their next step. I think that's something that Jens Stoltenberg uh, would like to begin uh, to so that the Asian leaders and their democracies and the NATO leaders that we have uh, start getting to know each other, working together, coordinating and communicating better. Um, and I think that that's going to be important going forward as we confront bigger adversaries. There are a lot of uh, bad guys out there. The other thing I would say is that I think she, President Xi of China, is going to be watching what our alliance and especially the U.S. really do. Do we lose interest? Do we say, well, never mind, as we all did, mm -hmm. to be honest about Georgia and uh, Crimea. Um, right. And I think it is so important that we do, as been suggested, push our allies to continue not to flag in their interest, not to have uh, one of our partners going out and saying, well, let's don't humiliate uh, Putin. Are you kidding me? We should be going all out to help the Ukraine repel this vicious attack. And she will get that message and she will see if we lose interest or if we stay strong. So I just appreciate so much, uh, Mary, you, the, you did with Secretary Pompeo. I know you do smile and you have a great personality too. I wasn't <laughs> trying to be mean, but... I think that the strength that, that you showed and the strength that we showed um, is what we need to continue to push for the strength of our alliance and our partners. We have 70 partners when we're all together. We had 70 partners in Afghanistan, our 30 allies and then our partners. That can be a formidable force, but America must lead and we must not lose interest. We must stay on course. America must lead. We want to extend our greatest thanks to Madam Ambassador Kay Bailey Hutchison for joining us tonight, as well as our co-chair, Secretary Pompeo, and Ambassador Robert O'Brien, and our fantastic seminar members, uh, many of whom have served in government and the military, and you can see them uh, on your television screens, you can hear them on the radio, you can follow them on social media. We encourage you to do all of that. We're going to take a little break uh, this summer before coming back in person at the Nixon Library later this year. So check the website for that. We're very excited and we'll be very happy to meet you in person then. I'm Mary Kissel uh, with the Nixon Seminar on Conservative Realism and National Security. Thanks so much for watching. Good night.